Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Some say the glass is largely full. Others say not so much. Some say the 2015 New York City budget is sound, that Mayor de Blasio has resolved the biggest challenge he inherited. Some say that significant issues remain in the de Blasio budget, with the hoped-for health insurance savings very uncertain. To prove that sums are greater than parts are James Parrott, Deputy Director and Chief Economist of the Fiscal Policy Institute. The Institute deals with economic, fiscal, and budgetary policy issues and works to increase the understanding of New York State's tax system and the adequacy of state and local public service. Also joining us is Charles Brescher. Chuck is the Consulting Research Director at the Citizens Budget Commission and a professor of health and public administration at NYU's Robert F. Wagner School of Public Service. Chuck is a longtime observer of New York City finance and fiscal politics. Welcome back, James. Welcome, Chuck. This budget season has been almost eerily quiet. Hasn't it? I mean, I've been looking at this now for 30-something years. I can't remember a quieter budget season. Doug, I don't know where you've been. Oh, okay, that's it. (laughs) It, um, um, Okay. uh, Thank God. You know, uh, it's been a very busy budget time uh, for reasons that only City Hall knows. The mayor decided to settle the UFT contract a week before the executive budget came out and then tried to incorporate the financial implications of that in the budget. That's a tall order. Keep in mind, this was, this was a settlement that covers a nine-year period, going back two years to cover the last part of the last pattern round, uh, and then a seven-year agreement with pretty modest increases. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he, he sort of settled the last one on the last pattern, and then, and then he thinks established a new pattern that will affect all 350,000 city workers. So, so, so this, in a sense, is the biggest labor settlement that there's ever been in the city's history. So he did this a week before the budget. So it's, you know, it's a tall order to sort of figure out the cost of that over the next several years and, and do that in the budget. So there's been a lot of discussion uh, among the people like Chuck and I who follow this stuff about, you know, what exactly is in there? How are they accounting for this? What's the implication of this? Is the city's budget sound going forward? And of course, my bottom line on that is that it looks like, you know, he pulled off a, a, a real challenge and settled this in a way that's pretty fiscally responsible. And I think it can be accommodated within the city's budget. And you know, of course, he was he was helped by the fact that the city's economy is doing all right right now. Revenues are coming in above expectations. Okay. Yeah. Chuck. Well, I, I want to uh, agree with James about the fact that I think this has been a very busy period. And but give a, give a the, lot the, of credit to... Right, but the, it hasn't had the acrimony and the conflict. It's been busy, but it's been busy, but quiet, no? Well, I think that the part of the strategy of the mayor and Bob Lynn, his Office of Labor Relations Director, has been to try and build a sense that there is some harmony between labor okay. and not, not be uh, fighting with each other in the public. But I think... Bob Lynn has been very busy and done a very comprehensive job in putting together a settlement. A lot of us were skeptical that this would get done in time for the budget, and they did pull it off. And I, I think uh, it's been hard work. I, I have concerns about parts of it, but I think you do have to give them a lot of credit for getting a very big job done. In a is, it, way. is it the most important labor negotiation in history? I mean, it sounds like a bit of hyperbole, but in some senses it is real big. Well, it is very big. It covers a long time period. It sets out a pattern for the next, for a seven year period, the five of which are sort of next. Right. But um, it involves a lot of money uh, and there are very big stakes. So, yeah, I think it, it is a very historic labor settlement. Uh, in terms of the budget dance that mm-hmm. usually takes place or has traditionally taken place between the city council right. and the mayor, the choreography's right. changed dramatically. It's a different dance. 
That could Talk be what you were, you were referring to in terms of yes. things have been quieter this yes. time because yes. there haven't been, been the sort of the daily, you know, uh, Fiscal Policy Institute offices are right off of Broadway in Lower Manhattan. Anytime there's a rally at City Hall over budget issues or anything else, I can hear about it. Ah. I hear the speeches, I hear the music and all that. I haven't heard that. This, you know, it, 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 that's what I meant. Well, the that, budget dance, the budget dance has changed. You know, so in short, what the budget dance usually was, where you know the uh, the city council would fight to, to include things in the budget when it's adopted, you know, at the end of June each year, right. and the mayor would not baseline that. So he would not say we're going to pay for this next year, right? Forcing the council to go back to the drawing board and 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 hold hearings and. And advocates would have to, you know, make their case to the city council. The city council would have to make their case to the mayor and so on. So, you know, each year there was about $300 million, $400 million. Right. Everything from child care to after school programs. Libraries, centers, cultural, fire houses, yeah. libraries, yep. and all of that. So all of that. So, so the mayor has basically baselined all of that. Now, mm -hmm. keep in mind that Bloomberg in his last budget, November of 2013, had so much money from additional revenues that he decided to put some of that towards baselining some of those yes. things. Yes. Sort of, you know, it was sort of a goodbye, sort of pat on the back to the council. You know, like, you're not going to have me to kick around anymore. But so here, I'm going to give you, you know, what you always fought, fought for. Yeah, I think the, there's going to be a different dance this year. Go ahead. They, they have a lot of the predictability is gone. You can almost know what it was going to be about mm -hmm. and how it was going to get settled in the past. Now. Uh, there's new items coming about because the, the old things have, have been settled in baseline. But there is a contention over adding 1,000 police, right. uh, adding some other civilians to the uniformed agencies, mm -hmm. and doing the free lunch for everybody. So those have been the priorities I think the council's identified. And it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out, whether it becomes something that, yeah, the mayor gives in on, or whether he actually you know, holds his ground and says, no, I haven't put it in and I'm not going to put it in. So there'll be a dance, but it's going to be a very different dance than the past. Stay tuned, and, and we'll see if they can not step on each right. other's toes. Mm -hmm. Let, just on the budget itself, Chuck, is this a financially responsible budget, and what does that mean if it is, and what does it mean if it isn't? Go. On. Well, it, it, it is a budget that adheres to the rules that have been established. Uh, they were very careful to do this settlement in a way that would follow the generally accepted accounting principles. So I think it, it's responsible in that sense. The, uh, the things that I would say are uh, ought to raise concerns about this are the backloading of a lot of the money in the settlement, that the, the payments are going to come late. Uh, a substantial amount of them uh, are going to come over four billion are going to come after the time of this financial plan. Um, which is and, the four-year plan yeah, coming which out is from four the years. budget. So it's, it's responsible in the sense that it's following the rules to balance the budget in the time of the financial plan. What, what I think is uh, sort of a violation of the spirit, if not the letter, of the accounting principles is this backloading of money, particularly the lump sum payments, where we're saying, you know, on the one hand, that we're giving people retroactive pay, these, four, these raises that the teachers didn't get in the last pattern, but we're, we're saying you're going to get it later. And in order to make it legit under the accounting rules, we're not going to call it retroactive pay. We're calling it restructured right. payments. And as I say, that makes it fit the letter, but not the spirit of this. And we ought to be sticking to the spirit, which is to pay for things when we use them and consume them. OK. I James? guess um, basically, I, th I, think, I, th I think what Chuck has laid out is right. I would say that in terms of uh, offsetting the cost of the lump sum payments, that are pushed out beyond the four years of the, of the current financial plan, that the mayor also has negotiated through this health care uh, cost savings agreement with the uh, city unions, $1.3 billion in annual savings. So over three years, that's $3.9 billion. So th that, in a sense, almost pays for that mm -hmm. obligation that he's pushing out beyond the financial plan. Well, it, Go ahead. aside from the, the numbers not exactly matching, but. Um, I think the, the, the important point is that they did bargain for these savings, and I hope they get them, but I think you have to be very skeptical about the ability to deliver $1.3 in annual recurring savings that bend the health care cost curve uh, in a process that so far has not identified any of the ways in which this is going to happen. 
and sets up a process that first says we're going to negotiate with the unions about how we count the savings, then we're going to go negotiate with them about what measures will achieve those savings, and then we're going to try and agree on whether or not we've actually accomplished them at the end of the year, and if we don't we agree we're going to go to an arbitrator who maybe is going to rule and have some power to say, yes, you have to do this. So it's a pretty complicated and risky process to get that, those savings. I think a lot of us were disappointed that the agreement didn't just say we're going to do cost sharing on the premiums, which is what the state government does, the federal government In does. In other words, co -pays. Yeah, just have a co-pay on the premium and, and then you know how much you're getting. And then if the unions want to come back and say, well, well, there's other ways we'd like to achieve the same savings, then you bargain from the fact that you start with the co-pays and you can give some of them back. But now we put it all at risk. James, well, respond. I mean, it makes, it yeah, makes some it, sense here. Basically, what they, uh, also we should keep in mind that this mayor has been in office for, uh, he's been in office for five months at this point. Mm -hmm. And he negotiated this deal when he was barely in office for four months at that point. Um, for a long time, there had not been constructive uh, negotiations between the city unions and the city hall. Previous mayor was there. So finally, there's starting to be constructive discussions. I agree it's a tall order to f sort of figure out exactly how you're going to get all of these health care mm -hmm. cost savings and so on. What Chuck is proposing, though, is it, you know, that you have a, the unions commit to make a copay up front, and then if they can find savings, then they're relieved of that obligation. What was agreed to was essentially the reverse of that, which is putting the emphasis on we're first going to find the cost savings. Um, and there's a consequence if we don't find the cost savings, then we'll have to resort to things like copay. So, you know, um, so copays again, again, are on the tables. So copays are sense. on the table. On one of the and, tables, and, and, and anyway. There's, <laughs> you know, there's an agreement there that looks to be enforceable. Uh, he said it remains to be seen how all that's going to work out. But, but you know, yeah, keep in mind that this mayor wanted to uh, change the labor management dialogue in New York City. It had been very in a very un unconstructive place for a long time. Right. He came in pretty quickly, changed that, mm -hmm. and this approach to health care cost savings, I think, was, was integral to that. I agree that there's both a change in attitude and a change in behavior in terms of the, the, the interaction of labor, municipal labor, and the, the mayor? Well, you know, they've come to an agreement. There's an outcome that's right. different. I think okay. you, you do have to give, okay. give them credit for that. But... Um, you know, the history of this is that there are um, countervailing pre pressures and they do have opposed interests and we, we have a nice spirit now, but I don't think it's going to last forever. There's already been some dissension among some of the uniform unions to the agreement and the pattern. Okay. Uh, so, I don't know, it's, it's nice now, but let's, let's see if okay. it works and how long it lasts. Le yeah. Let's go to the teacher's contract, what that meant, and this notion of pattern bargaining, because much of the analysis centers on the assumption that a pattern will be established by this contract. And the second set of questions is how much is this going to cost? So let's, let's talk about what pattern bargaining is, then look at the teacher's contract to see what they did, and then see how the mathematics right. rolls out for everybody. Mm -hmm. Start. Pattern bargaining is something, you know, the uh, city of New York deals with 150 labor unions, 150 separate contracts covering 350,000 workers. So there are, there are a half dozen or so major unions. So when the, when the city enters a new bargaining period and settles a major a contract with one of the major unions, it does that with an eye toward establishing a pattern that, that it can then apply to other unions to give it some stability and predictability about what its financial implications are. So no mayor sets a pattern agreement without the commitment that he or she is going to extend this citywide. This whole labor negotiation backlog stemmed from the fact that Bloomberg didn't, didn't honor that commitment. Longstanding, the, the importance of pattern bargaining had served the city well. He decided to, to, to call a halt to the last pattern mm -hmm. that was negotiated in 2008. He continued to to reach agreements with other major unions for another year, well into you know into the fall of 2009. So you can't really say that, well, the financial crisis really made it impossible for the city to honor that. He 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 entered into those contracts at the very on. time, okay. and then well. continued to apply those. So 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 uh, part of this settlement 
and, and, and one of the reasons why it's so significant was Bill de Blasio not only completed the last round, keep in mind there were a couple of arbitrations going sure. on where, where the arbitrators were basically going to force the city's hand saying, you're going to have to honor this last settlement. You're going to have to give the teachers the two 4% raises from the last round. So, so that's the last round. And the other part of this is that the mayor did this in a way to settle agreements over a seven-year period, you know, two years behind us, five years prospectively, that he did to try and set a pattern for the other unions. Chuck, well, I, I, think, go ahead. I think the history on this has been revised in certain ways that I wouldn't call it entirely accurate. Um, the it was being nice. Yeah, the, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the, but he hasn't the said decision exactly by how. Bloomberg. Right. Right. Okay. Go ahead. The decision by initially Mayor Bloomberg and then the city council, who remember the labor reserves are part of the budget. They're adopted as part of the budget, and the the, the city council signs on the, off on this as well. So the decision to um, take the money that was in the labor reserve for the 4% increases for the teachers was made in the context of not just the fiscal crisis in 2008, but the fact that that impacted the state and that the Department of Education was heavily dependent on state aid. That state aid was cut dramatically by the state. And the mayor and the council in doing the budget were faced with a choice of, either, of having to lay off teachers because state aid had been cut. And the mayor made the decision not to lay off the teachers and said, I'm going to fund this with the labor reserve. So there isn't the money available for those raises. So I think it was a very smart and uh, in the spirit of protecting the kids' decision to say, we're not going to do layoffs. We're going to use the money in the labor reserve to maintain staffing at the Department of Education. The UFT has not sort of acknowledged and said that that's legitimate and has fought for the pattern. The pattern is a device that simplifies life and collective bargaining. I don't think it serves the city all that well. It, A, it's violated sometimes. The, the, the police have said, we don't want to follow the pattern yeah. of ask for more money and have gotten it in arbitration. It's not an absolute rule. It, it, it is um, not a good way to deal with staffing city government when you need people. It, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense to say that uh, we're going to give the same percentage increases to people who we'd like to recruit for to be math teachers in high school as we do to sanitation men when every time we give a sanitation men's exam, you know, there's 40,000 people who pass it and we hire two or 300 a year. Mm -hmm. So I think deviating from the pattern would make a lot of sense. It would let you target positions that you, that you now have difficulty staffing. But what replaces it? Doesn't, doesn't the, the simplicity of the heuristic or the paradigm allow you to not in a sense, waste incredible amounts of time and intellectual resources negotiating everyone? Is it worth it at the end economically to greatly expand that negotiating base? Well, I think you can, you can and they don't, you know, you don't literally negotiate 150 different times. The pattern makes it simple, but you can negotiate with coalitions as they do for, right, the, they have. for the health care insurance. And you can start to say, these, you know, we want to not have everybody be treated exactly the same, that what's going on in the real world of the labor market matters. Yeah. And, and there ought to be deviations from the pattern. Well, so you know, yeah. and, and I think there are. Yeah. Uh, and and in, in the teacher settlement, there, were, there was a backlog of, <coughs> of education policy issues. Right. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, relating to, to how city schools are managed. Uh, and how standards are applied, and how teachers are motivated, and so on. Uh, and, and the fact that those hadn't been addressed or resolved in any meaningful way for several years now had been a, was a growing problem. Yep. And I think this contract settlement addressed a lot of those. And it did, you know, it did make some innovative uh, steps in terms of allowing for differential pay for teachers, and so on, and, and opportunities for schools to try and experiment with a, a different approach to teaching and so on. So that's exactly the sort, of, uh, the sort of flexibility that you would like to see. And I think this mayor is going to take that and have sort of a, uh, a uh, from some scope for flexibility as he approaches the other unions within the economic consequences, the, the economic mm -hmm. cost mm -hmm. of the pattern that's been, that, 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 that's, been a, uh, that's been set with regard to teaching. Keep in mind, this pattern called for 10% increases over seven years. That's uh, about, you know, 1.6, 1.7% uh, a year. That's less than inflation right now. So 
you know, he settled those contracts at a pretty modest cost. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, again, I'm going to turn to you, uh, uh, Chuck. Uh, uh, Maria Doulis over at, at your shop argued that it removed a real uncertainty around the city's financial plan, so that alone provides some stability. And also, does this agreement have the ability to get us through the contracts without severely compromising the rest of what the city does? Well, let me go, go ahead, back to the go, issue go, about, go the, about the pattern. Go back. I think um, Maria and I and others give the, um, the city, the mayor, and, and Bob Lynn a lot of credit for the, the part of this settlement that deals with what they hope to establish as the pattern. Okay. The, you know, the 10% the over the seven years as it's laid out is, I think, a very reasonable pattern to try and establish. Right. Um, my concern with it is um, whether it's going to work, okay, that the, um, the dilemma they got themselves into with the, what I'll call the retroactive pay is that they have to set, how to set it up as if it wasn't retroactive pay. Right. It has to be defined as payment for service in the year that it's made, right. except for the retirees where they cleared that up. Um, so it, what it really says is that the pay, one could argue, and I, the union people are smarter than we are on, on this, you know, they're going to argue that this isn't a 10% pattern, this is an 18% pattern. There's four 2% raises that are given to people who stay on the payroll that's not defined as retroactive pay, and we may, ha we may have, I don't know, you know, the uh, arbitrators, the negotiators are going to do it, but I think one of the risks with this is that it won't get interpreted as retroactive pay because that's not what they're presenting it as, and the pattern will be interpreted as being 18%, not 10%. Is there a danger there? Well, I could see where somebody would argue that, but I, but, but I, I find it hard to believe that the other side would accept that. Okay. No, I don't yeah. think, yeah. I don't yeah. think yeah. we should. So, but right. so, uh, right. Okay, then let's, let, let's, let's look at the total cost of both the teacher's contract per se and what it would be if, in fact, the rest of the municipal mm -hmm. labor force followed pretty closely that numerical pattern. So how much does the teachers' union contract cost per se, and how much is this total package about? Right. Do, if you have the numbers, you should. I, I don't remember. I, I think I had <laughs> that. I think if, if you count the money beyond the... Um, Beyond the, the financial plan, the four point thing, it was about 13, it's about $17 billion as the incremental cost. Okay. Um, uh, of all Does of that things. sound reasonable? Well, you know, if, if, you, if you look, I mean, it, that sounds like a big number, right? $17 billion. But it's over time and da da da. But, yeah. Yeah. but it's basically, but, but, so but it covers yeah. increases over a nine year period. And if yeah, you look I'm, at it in relation to the, you know, the, the, the total personal services budget for the city, the total that pays for wages and salaries, pensions, and health insurance is about uh, 45, $45 billion a year. Mm -hmm. You know, over, over four years, that's $170 billion. $17 billion is about 10% of that. So, you know, looked at that way, it's not insignificant, although on the other hand, it doesn't crowd out everything else. Yeah, but I think there's... Go ahead, I'm sorry. One way to, to think about this, if you compare what personal ter total personal service costs, including pensions and health insurance, what they were projected to grow on an annual basis under the previous administration mm -hmm. in his last budget. Right. That was about 2.3% a year. With this settlement, not counting the four, mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the $4 billion in lump sums mm -hmm. paid after this financial plan, that annual growth rate is about 3%. So it's a difference of about 7 tenths of 1% in the city budget. The difference between de Blasio and Bloomberg approach to the labor budget. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I wouldn't disagree with James that, you know, $17 billion sounds like a lot. That's probably not the best way to talk about the implications of this contract. I think what you've got is that, that concerns uh, me about this is that the way it's laid out with, again, the raises growing in the, the last years of the plan uh, and the retroactive pay sort of backloaded into there, you, we, there's now, by the city's accounting, a $3.2 billion gap in, in 18, which people say, you, you know, is modest by historic standards. It's not so modest. $3.2 billion is, you're starting to get up there. Um, and that is, that counts on getting the $1.3 billion in healthcare savings. 
which would already get it up to 4.5 if you, if you didn't have that. And it's, it's assuming that the city's economy is going to continue to be healthy for another four years. Which is, so there's a big risk in, in those outcomes. Well, there are risks, but I, if I may, just for yeah. a second, I mean... Uh, no, it's your show. Just, no, no, no. no. Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> but IBO seems to suggest that the, the administration is playing the classic game of understating revenues. Their revenue projections show a surplus of a billion next year. The, the administration shows none. The administration shows this 3.2 billion and, and the out years. The, the uh, IBO is saying it's much less than that. So, the, you know, there's this fuzziness about projecting numbers. I'm sorry, James, so, for interrupting. So, uh, I was going to cite the same report you were Oh, well, to, so. oh great minds <laughs> declare. I'm you're sorry, I my notes and I was looking at yours. Right, and not yours. So, so the IBO you know, calls these out year budget gaps um, unexceptional and noted that there are built in mm -hmm. cushions, even beyond the fact that they expect that the tax revenues will come in a little bit higher. There's a billion dollars in the Retiree Health Benefits Trust Fund, which the previous administration had used to plug gaps when necessary. Mm -hmm. There's also an, uh, an extraordinary amount in the General Reserve. So there's an additional billion dollars or so in the General Reserve for the next four years that if they don't need it for any contingency purpose, that will be available. I mean, you know, so, so I professional I budget makers hide money. The gaps are unexceptional and there are built-in cushions. Okay. The budget, the budget has to be adopted by June 30th. The fiscal year begins July 1. What do you see before now, between now and the final budget? Is it going to look any different than the budget looks now? What might change? And you've got well, 15 seconds. Okay, it, it's the, the issue with the dance with the city council. I think, are we going to get another 1,000 police or not? Are we going to do free school lunch for everybody? Those are going to be the key things. It's not insignificant amount of money, but not huge, and I think they're... There will be some compromise around those issues, but it's not going to be a uh, big change in the shape of the budget. Okay, excellent. James? You have Chuck's absolutely right on you that. You have I'm absolutely right. right. Okay, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to talk thank with you. both of you. you. My thanks to James Parrott and Charles Brescia for alerting us to the complexities and uncertainties of New York City's budget. Join me next week when my guest will be Ian Vander Walker of the Brennan Center. We'll talk, you guessed it, money! This time, the dark money of campaign financing, here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.